So this is before the power washing. I'm trying to try and give you a little before and after okay, shots. Guys here. Welcome to another shop update. Uh, if you don't under, if you're new to this uh, channel or new to my shop updates um, and don't understand what's going on with the tanks, um, I'm going to put a link to a video last shop update up above. Um, I'm going to explain about the tanks the fiasco of picking those tanks up, how they weren't cleaned. And I will uh, bring you back and show you the rest of the clip on the tanks and then bring you back to show you or tell you what else is going on in the shop. What I'm going to do is just try and get the sh stuff off of the top, maybe a little bit off of the sides here. Um, I'm not sure how well this is going to work, but anyways, before and after shot. Well, there's after half an hour power washing, and I sprayed degreaser on it too. And I got to tell you, it's it would take forever to get this stuff off unless there's some kind of extra heavy-duty industrial cleaner that will take it off, but. Um, that stuff that I have is pretty potent and it wouldn't take it off and besides that that shit is all over my trailer not I and I try to power wash it off too and it kind of like sticks but look at the parking lot I mean I, I've got a I've gonna have to move the trailer and I'm going to have to try and take the hose in and spray this down. It's ridiculous. Um, it's just ridiculous. Okay, so there was the tanks. And as you see, that, that stuff was all over the place. It was, it was all over everything. It's still all over my trailer, even though I've washed it probably three or four times since then. Um, it's all over the power washer. It's it was all over everything, but I took it down to Brooklyn um, I kind of went down I, I do not go over the George Washington Bridge because it cost too much in tolls for me to go over it with a trailer truck and trailer It's over 120 bucks. So um, Yeah, I take the tap Tappan Zee Bridge and then uh, Throgneck Bridge and go over to Long Island and um, I went into Brooklyn that way, got there, um, a very narrow street where this place was, uh, a typical New York City type of business. It's all gated, steel gates, uh, um, fencing. Um, you can't get access to it. I had a hard time uh, finding out how to get into them to get to the people I actually had to call um, the seller and have him call them um, he had another number for, listed for him to let them know that I was there it was kind of a fiasco unloading it the guy had a forklift with the long forks and he says well I just usually roll them off of the trailer onto the sidewalk and you know there's people even though this coronavirus was going on uh, there was people, a lot of people walking up and down the sidewalk, and I'm thinking, no, wait, just put the forks on the truck and I'll roll the tank onto the forks and you can just pick it up. You don't have to roll it off onto the sidewalk. But anyways, we got them unloaded, um, got them things off of my trailer, and then the fiasco starts. My GPS... Um, takes you however way you want to go or how it, it does not take you however way you want to go I have not figured out how to program it so that I can tell it to take me a certain way to begin with I got enough the major uh, um, interstates on Long Island and it it was probably a good 40 blocks through Brooklyn before I got to this place. So I, I was really didn't know where I was in relationship to um, the, the major roads going out of Long Island. 
So I just left it up to the GPS, hoping that it would take me back the same way that I came in. It did not. It, this thing got it got worse, and it, it would have been a lot worse had it not been for this coronavirus, because it took me over the Manhattan Bridge into Manhattan, and here I am with this truck and trailer um, in Man in Manhattan. Um, and what it was trying to do was trying to get me to the Holland Tunnel and, and taking me out of uh, New York City that way. And again, the traffic was very light for New York City because of this virus thing going on or outside would have, I'd probably still be there trying to get the truck and trailer out of there. But anyways, um, Uh, I, I start to go, I'm following this guy in a Porsche, a Porsche 911, and, and we were headed towards the Holland Tunnel, and um, for some reason he just stopped and it was a green light, and I couldn't figure out what it was, and there was a cop in front of him, a, a, a beat cop, a cop on foot. And um, he flagged him on, and I started following him, and, and the guy jumped out in front of me, and he says, you can't take the trailer in the tunnel. And I says, what, what, what am I supposed to do? He says, you got to go to the Lincoln Tunnel. You can't take the trail in the Holland Tunnel. And I says, well, okay, how am I going to get around? And which way is it? Um, so he, he backed some people up that were behind me, and um, I was able to back up a little bit, get down a side street, and, and get out of there. But... It, it was just a fiasco. Those tanks turned out to be the hugest fiasco in the world. But anyways, um, let's go on to uh, something else. Uh, I installed some lights on the truck and let's go into that right now. Okay, I'm over the front of the truck and what I have done is just mounted those two driving lights. The big round ones that are on the outside of the fog lights. I'm not sure if I like them. I mean, it's not that I don't like the light. It's it's just that I, it, it to me, it appears big for the truck. Um, kind of, to me, out of place. But other people don't think the same thing that I do. You know, I ran it past some people and they thought it looked fine. Um, they said, you know, the appearance of it isn't the main concern, it's how it works is the main concern. And they're absolutely right, but you know, I like to have the truck looking good too. And to me, it kind of looks a little bit out of place, but maybe I'll get to uh, get to um, get used to it and, and uh, see how, uh, the biggest factor is seeing how they work. Um, so what I've got to do is I can't really set it up in the shop. I've got, you know, I've got this car in the shop, and before what I did is uh, kind of got the truck level because of sloped floors, got the truck level and set up a piece of cardboard and uh, shine, shown it on that. But I've got this car up in the air for the seat belts and um, can't really do it. So what I'm going to do is um, come back here tonight after dark and uh, s uh, set the car out on the street and uh, set it up that way, set the lights up that way. But um, when, when you, let me call it peri peripheral vision, um, w when you're not looking directly into the beam, it doesn't appear that bright, but when you get down, it's kind of focused into a narrow spot type light. Um, let me, uh, I'm going to turn you off for a second, and what I'll do is turn the lights on and show it to you. Now, here they are, and um, i, I got to tell you, I'm thinking that they look brighter on the camera than they do in, in real life. Um, but anyways, um, there they are. They're, if I didn't mention it before, they're 55 watts, um, and they're halogen. They're halogen because my main lights headlights on the tr uh, truck are halogen i bought halogen fog lights and i wanted to keep that halogen driving lights also 
it, it really looks funny when you're driving at night and you see a car or a truck that's got like um, halogen headlights and, and LED driving lights. It, it's just, it kind of doesn't look right. So I wanted to keep them matched. Doesn't look right to me. So that's why I wanted to keep them matched. But anyways, um, there it is. And again, I have to set these, but let me take you down and show it to you um, in the spot. And um, as you can see, there is a narrow focus beam. You can actually see that center part in there um, where it kind of focuses. I don't know whether you can see that. Maybe you can see the center part in there where it's kind of focus, a beam type of effect. But anyways, um, there's that. I didn't show you any of the installation. Again, I had run the wires out there from the switch on the dashboard. If you, anybody, you've seen the other shop update, um, I when I installed the three switches, one for the fuel transfer, one for fog lights, and one for driving lights. But I had, hadn't installed the driving lights when I installed the switch, um, but um, subsequently got them from and they're the same brand as the fog lights, or the Hala, 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 however you pronounce it, a light. Let me shut you off. I'll just show you and this. And here we are on the inside of the truck. And as you can see, the outboard or left one, as you're looking at it, is those lights, the driving lights. This is uh, the inner one, is uh, the center one, there's the fog lights. And uh, the end one is the fuel transfer. But anyways, there it is. It's done. Not sure if it's going to stay, but it's done. Okay. Um, in the last shop update, I had told you about that other generator that I had to take to Texas after the tank move. Um, <clears throat> I did take that to Texas. I um, <clears throat> took it down there. I'll try and throw some pics and pics up here as I'm talking, but... Uh, it was an uneventful trip. <clears throat> I took it to a ranch, actually, in Texas. <clears throat> they use it for their irrigation. Um, they have pumps, uh, uh, 25 to 50 horsepower uh, water pumps that they use to um, irrigate their fields with. Um, so they use these generators to supply power for those pumps, uh, 440 three-phase generators to supply power for those pumps. But anyways, I took it down there. Uh, again, I'll throw a couple of pics and pics of uh, while I was down there uh, before I got unloaded. Um, but anyways, it was kind of uneventful. Then on the way back, I had to stop in Indiana, pick up another generator from an auction yard there and uh, uh, take that to a customer down in Pennsylvania. So I um, had that to do. Um, now I have another Texas run that I have to make. This is uh, going on Memorial Day weekend and I'm gonna probably be leaving Memorial Day and going down to Texas again and picking up um, three or four generators, I'm not sure, three or four generators at an auction yard in Odessa, Texas, and uh, bringing them back to Pennsylvania. But anyways, um, let's get into, I told you that the Triumph was back in here again after having been detailed on the inside for seat belts, and I ended up putting those seat belts in. Uh, I'm not gonna show you the installation, but I'll show you before or after shots of it. Um, so here we go. Okay, I'm back over here on that Triumph. Uh, I'm going to be putting the seat belts in. I had to pull the rear seat cushion out. It just uh, sits on them two uh, brackets there. Okay, let me do a quick little disclaimer here. Um, and I don't usually do these things, but let me tell you why I'm doing it. 
Um, he wanted seat belts put in this. His wife wanted seat belts put in this car. Where these seat belts came from, I, I kind of showed you in the last shop update that there was no instructions or anything with the seat belts. <clears throat> but it, there was a card there that where apparently somebody bought them. Now I'm not even sure whether he bought them or they came with the car when he bought the car. But she wants them installed. So I googled this uh, seat belt installations on a Triumph TR3, and I came up with forums from uh, Triumph forums, and they kind of showed these seat belt installations. But let me tell you something. <clears throat> One of the things that they mentioned in the forum is this shoulder harness belt is under, I think, federal guidelines supposed to be attached a point above the shoulder. And logically, because of this car, you can't do that. So I'm not sure why that regulation is in place. If it has something to do with the physical constraint of, of the person or what it has to do with whether it's a a uh, injury impact problem um, what it is but let me tell you that it can't be done in this car the the uh, shoulder belt attachment cannot be put above the shoulder because logically there is absolutely no place above the shoulder to put the the uh, attachment points so if you're doing this do it under not because i've done it this way but because of what you need to do um again if the car doesn't actually have to have seat belts in it car was manufactured before seat belts were required so it's grandfathered in it does not have to be put into it she wanted them in there but again, there was no instructions with these things, and on the forum, they tell you that they kind of put them in the way that I put them in, but they tell you on that forum that it does not meet the requirements of federal regulations for seatbelt installation. So just be forewarned, this does not comply with what the seatbelt installation requirements are bolted to the bottom of the cushion through the brackets um, but I, I couldn't uh, get the drill underneath there it's kind of really tight uh, it's uh, probably going to even be tight with the those brackets in the way um, I can't get a conventional drill in there a um, um, cordless drill uh, so what I'm trying to do, uh, gonna try and do, is use that right angle uh, air drill to do it with, because I've got to get into the side of the uh, drive shaft tunnel to uh, put the one set of brackets in for the seat belts. Okay, so there's one side in. Um, I still got to do uh, the shoulder uh, uh, attachment point up here and then um, the lap belt attachment point down there someplace. I've got to figure it out, put it together and kind of figure out what the best attachment point down there is going to be. And here we are. Uh, they're installed <clears throat> Really didn't like drilling through that, but there was absolutely no option um, Had to drill through the vinyl leather vinyl whatever it is um, To get that uh, anchor point for the shoulder harness, but really didn't like doing that but I talked to the guy and he was okay with it. She just wanted seat belts installed in the thing. So um, there we go.
done. So this pipe laying on the floor here, um, inch and a half and three quarter inch piping. Um, I'm going to use it for the airline. My uh, landlord pulled it out of a tenant space where the guy had left and uh, he was removing some of the stuff that the guy had installed. Um, and I'm just going to use it to uh, run the airlines as long as it's available. There's another length of uh, inch and a half pipe and I will pick up the fittings for it. Um, kind of oversized for what I need but it's what's available and might as well use it as long as it's available. I'll take you over and show you the compressors right now. So I had showed you this in another shop update. This is a compressor that I bought uh, at an auction and I'm going to piggyback this compressor off of uh, that one or piggyback that one off of this one once I get it hooked up. This is a three-phase compressor and um, I, I've got um, this switch that will allow me to connect the uh, um, pressure switch. The pressure switch on these compressors are always like 110 where this compressor is 223 phase. Um, it's a 110 pressure switch that turns the compressor on and off so you need this um, uh, contactor to uh, uh, get from the 220 to the 110 to uh, use it to uh, start the compressor the the lower voltage will enable that contactor to uh, start the three-phase compressor um, anyways I'm going to tie these two of them together and uh, with that inch and a half, this is, uh, I've got a two inch outlet. It's pushed down to, got a reducer down to inch and a half. And I will just pull off of that, make a, like a little header here to tie these two compressors together and then run those inch and a half lines out. Now, I, I don't have, um, I've got to get the wiring over here, the three phase wiring over here for this compressor. And uh, the lift, I don't have the lift and probably won't be getting that back until um, sometime at the end of the this summer. But uh, that's when I'll do it. Let me take you back over to the piping and I'll explain something else. So again, you. here's that piping that's laying on the floor. And like I say, there's another length of piping that I've got that I will do it. Um, so I, I told you during that Texas trip that I had uh, a small backhaul of a compressor in Indiana from an auction yard. Well, I was at that auction yard. I saw some trucks. Now, let me explain to you um, the haul truck is still a viable thing. What I'm going to show you right now is something else that I'm thinking about doing. And this only added fuel to the fire of thinking about doing it as I went to this auction yard. At this auction yard, there were some trucks there. While I was waiting for the forklift to load that generator onto my trailer, I was kind of looking around at them and I will throw a pick and pick over there um, of something that I was looking at. Now, the this uh, truck that was over there um, I wouldn't really have bought um, be because of the old style split ring type of hubs that were on it. Um, but it did lead fuel to the fire. Actually, I've been looking at something else before that and we will throw another pick and pick over there. And But um, what it did is lead me to uh, uh, sign up for one of these online auctions because I'm thinking that uh, vehicles should be go starting to go fairly cheap because of the uh, current situation in the country. Um, but what I've been thinking about doing is getting one of those trucks just for local deliveries. Uh, Things were that I do locally that I really don't need a 40-foot uh, trailer for. I can just throw uh, small things on the back of that truck or day runs. Um, it has nothing to do. The uh, haul truck is still going to be an ongoing project. 
um, that is for over the road type, going to be for over the road type use. This would be just something that uh, me and possibly my grandson could use to uh, run some local materials or haul some local stuff. Um, but anyways, that's it for this shop update. Thanks for watching, guys. Hit that like button. Leave a comment. Subscribe.